This video was sponsored by Nebula, the streaming service owned and run by creators, including me. Hey, happy Friday. This week, Google killed a bunch of products to cut some costs. 5G phones became the majority across the world and still somehow nobody cares. And the Ethereum merge actually happened successfully. Welcome to the Friday checkout. Okay, we start this week's brief with a couple of new products. First, Sony showed off the next-gen PlayStation VR 2 headset to reviewers for hands-on and eyes-on first impressions and told us that it's coming early 2023. The headset looks cool. We have now learned that there's a single 4.5 meter connection via USB-C and we saw some new VR games, but there's still no information about price or accurate availability. Then, in weird news, apparently even apps are experiencing inflation, but it's mainly on iOS, and actually it might be more related to Apple's app tracking transparency policies than anything else. So while Apptopia says that Google Play Store in-app purchase prices have risen by 9% year over year in the US, the same increase on iOS is actually 40%. It seems that not being able to monetize effectively through advertising actually caused app makers to raise their prices to try to make more money through in-app purchases, which of course then also benefits Apple through increased app store revenues. What a surprise. And then in news that made me say, wow, Adobe actually announced buying Figma for $20 billion, as it basically acknowledged that Figma is a fantastic design platform that is browser-based that Adobe just can't compete with. I think users might hate this if Figma becomes part of the insanely expensive Adobe subscription that I and many others have spent many years trying to get rid of. Apparently Adobe massively overpaid for Figma, which I suppose means that Figma's leadership was initially like, no, we have standards, we don't like Adobe, we don't want to work with you. And then Adobe was like, yeah, but we have $20 billion. And then Figma was like, okay, fine. I guess $20 billion would make me reconsider some of my moral conditions as well. Anyway, in bad news, there are now new crazy thin deep insert ATM skimmers being found in New York City. They are half the height of a US dime coin, so they are super difficult to spot. They capture magnetic strip info, and they also have a tiny camera to capture you putting in your pin. You can of course still just cover your hands as you input your pin, that still works, so maybe just pick that up as a habit, but ouch. And in uplifting kind of tech news, let's talk about Patagonia, the favorite outdoorsy wear company for tech bros and VCs alike, and also apparently me. The company's founders are giving away the private entity all $3 billion worth of shares to two separate trusts to put profits into climate-related goals. Patagonia has taken their environmental footprint super seriously from the start, and the new announcement takes that even further, saying things like, as of now, Earth is our only shareholder, and all profits in perpetuity will go to our mission to save our home planet. Okay, that's it for my brief, and for my first proper story of the week, let's actually take a look at the stuff that Google is shutting down now. Google Sundar Pichai has been hinting at layoffs for a while, suggesting that the whole company needs to be 20% more efficient. And while Google's layoffs aren't official, The Verge first reported that Google is likely quitting making Pixel Books, its own Chrome OS laptops. The long-awaited Pixel Book 2 is apparently cancelled, despite supposedly being far along in development. And Rick Ostelow himself, just a few months ago, saying that they are going to do Pixel Books in the future. I guess Google just got bored with their laptops laptops like they have with so many other initiatives in the past, and while there are no news of the company killing their upcoming tablet or the foldable Pixel phone yet, we have heard confirmed news that a bunch of other R&D teams have been salvaged across the company as well. Apparently half of the projects at one of Google's research and development divisions, known as Area 120, have been cut, leaving only AI-first projects to continue. Area 120 shipped real projects like Orion Wi-Fi, which is part of Google Fi, and an HTML5 gaming platform, which is now part of Chrome, and plenty more, so this wasn't just a moonshot lab either. I get that belts might have to be tightened, but Google is a huge and super profitable company, so cutting down on R&D seems like a strange move. Okay, and my second story of the week is going to be that 5G phones have now officially taken over 4G phones. Specifically, Counterpoint Data said this week that more 5G phones are shipping now than 4G ones officially. Counterpoint had already estimated this happening for a specific month earlier this year, but now there is enough data to confirm that it's a thing long term. 
And by the way, looking at geography, China's new 5G smartphone sales are at something like 84% and North America, probably thanks to the iPhone, is about 75% as well. And the fact that this happened just two years after the first 5G smartphone had launched makes this transition much faster than the 2G to 3G and even the 3G to 4G one. And I find that speed kind of funny because study after study shows us that while the previous jumps were actually significant in terms of performance, the current one is kind of really underwhelming. If you remember last year, I covered a very funny cell phone from Ericsson, which proudly and yet accidentally showed that a ton of people either had a 5G plan or a 5G phone, but not the two together, meaning that they couldn't be bothered to upgrade one or the other for real speed improvements. And when I polled my followers on Twitter, where you should definitely follow me if you haven't already, only 6.2% said that they had 5G and actually saw improvements. Everyone else said that they either don't have it or that their experiences stayed the same or even got worse. I mean, talk of underwhelming. I actually still don't have a 5G plan despite having a 5G capable phone and my girlfriend is convinced that her phone is lying to her about having 5G because it just says that she has 5G all the time since she got the new SIM card. Uh, whether she's in a tunnel, whether she's on the highway, anywhere, it just says 5G all the time. Whether the internet is fast, whether it works or not. So uh, it's a great situation, but anyway, the sales of 5G phones are doing fantastic. Okay, and my third story of the week is going to be the big news around the cryptocurrency Ethereum. Specifically, the merge finally happened yesterday, as Ethereum went from an energy-intensive proof-of-work blockchain model to a proof-of-stake blockchain model that doesn't require resource-intensive mining for processing transactions. This is huge because Ethereum is gigantic on its own. It's kind of the second largest cryptocurrency after Bitcoin. And of course, a lot of other projects are built on top of Ethereum as a kind of platform. So all of those things potentially just got a lot less problematic. The merge was delayed many times, so it took longer than expected, but it's a great achievement anyway. And I congratulate the developers. Vitalik Buterin, the main Ethereum guy, said that this would reduce worldwide electricity consumption by a 0.2% or something crazy like the country of Finland's energy consumption, though people have noted that many miners might just move to mining other coins with their hardware or even just Ethereum Classic instead, which remains intact. But still, a more sustainable approach to use Ethereum and all the decentralized apps that are built on top of it is still fantastic news. So now you can just buy and sell as many NFTs as you want without feeling all that guilty. Now, a much more productive use of your money than buying badly drawn pictures of monkeys is actually a subscription to Nebula. Nebula is a premium video streaming service built and owned by creators, including me, and it hosts a ton of fantastic content from us that you won't find anywhere else, including YouTube. I have uploaded seven full episodes of my Nebula original series called Technorama, where I do deep dives into the technology presented in science fiction movies in the usual tech author style, with episode 8 on the way too, as well as bonus videos that I do as additions to my main videos for those people who like to dive deeper, and all of my usual videos ad-free and early access, of course. Other creators include Real Engineering, who has fantastic series about the logistics of D-Day and the Battle of Britain, Polymatter, whose China Actually Nebula original series is just a fantastic watch for anyone trying to understand the country, Real Life Lore, whose modern conflict series breaks down, well, modern conflict of course, in ways that would probably be too sensitive for YouTube, and there is a lot more. Oh, and we've also been working super hard on improving our apps over time, adding requested features, improving performance, and covering more platforms too. Nebula is a collection of many of my all-time favorite YouTubers coming together and making even better and even more content. It's incredibly affordable with my link down in the description, just $3 a month, and that money actually goes towards funding our businesses directly. So thank you very much if you sign up. I hope you check it out, and I'll see you next Friday.